Hi, and welcome to this week's episode of Reading the Gospels Through Hebrew Eyes. We're going to talk about Jesus being a shepherd today from John chapter 10 and how he takes care of his sheep, he protects them, his sheep hear his voice. But we're going to talk about how Jesus said these words in the context of Hanukkah. Hanukkah is a Jewish festival that a lot of Christians don't know very much about. So we'll look at a bit of the history and we'll see how all of this is connected. Everything from Hanukkah to Jesus talking about being a shepherd to the temple area where this took place. And we'll try and pull that all together so that we can understand the Old Testament and ancient Near Eastern background of shepherding, especially how shepherds were kings. And then how all of this relates to how Jesus is our Hanukkah good shepherd. So we'll jump into John chapter 10 with verse 22 to kind of get our bearings as to where we're at and what's going on as we go into the dialogue that follows. So John 10, 22. At that time, the feast of dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade, sometimes also translated the portico of Solomon. The Greek word there is stoa. That's where the Stoics, at Greek philosophical school, that's where the Stoics get their name because they first met in the porch or the stoa, which was in Athens. This particular place is mentioned a couple of times in the book of Acts, in Acts 3 as well as Acts 5, as a place where the early church would gather. So in Acts 3, after Peter had healed a man, everybody runs together in the portico called Solomon's. And then in Acts 5.12, the church regularly was together, all together, in Solomon's portico. And you can see from this replica of first century Jerusalem that you can visit there in the, the uh, museum in Jerusalem. You can see a replica of the temple. And we are, from this perspective, as it were, on the Mount of Olives, looking across the Kidron Valley at the temple. And that eastern side is where the portico of Solomon would have been, a great meeting area for, for the early church. So this took, this took place in what's called here the Festival of Dedication. That is the Festival of Hanukkah. Now, there's a lot of history here, so we're just going to kind of summarize it as best we can in the time that we have. Now, Hanukkah is not a mosaic festival. It's not like Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles, uh, the New Year, Rosh Hashanah, or any of those others that you can read about in the Torah. Instead, Hanukkah came about in the second century. So let me give you a very brief history as to how Hanukkah came about. So first of all, the Jews were under the control of the Syrians. At the after the death of Alexander the Great, his empire was divided between his generals, and Judea came under Seleucid or Syrian control. And there was a Syrian or Seleucid leader by the name of Antiochus IV Epiphanes. And basically what he was trying to do was to turn the Jews into Greeks. He was called, he was trying to Hellenize them, which is basically means to Greekify them, trying to get them to think and believe and worship and act just like the Greeks did. Now, just like today and just like throughout history, Anytime that you have a cultural or political movement, what do you have? You have typically three kinds of reactions. You have people in the middle who kind of have a, a live and let live. I mean, they just don't want to get involved in all the, the messy parts of this particular movement. They just want to live their lives. Those are in the middle. But then you also have the pro and the anti, which we'll call the left and the right. So just like today, just like in all these movements, you had the pro-Hellenizers among the Jews, they were all gung-ho about Hellenization. They loved the Greek idea. They loved the Greek culture. They loved aspects of the, of the Greek religious life. And so they were very pro-Hellenization. Then you had the right side. You had the very anti-Hellenization. They didn't want anything to do with the Greeks, the Syrians, all of these forces, all of these pressures that Antiochus IV Epiphanes was placing upon them. So one thing to keep in mind about Hanukkah is that it originated as the, the outgrowth of a Jewish dispute about how they should deal with these, this Hellenistic push by the Syrian or Seleucid overlord. Okay, I'll explain why that's important in just a minute. Well, what happened was Antiochus IV Epiphanes took control of the temple as he was trying to force this Hellenization down the throats of the Jews. He desecrated the temple by offering unlawful sacrifices. He dedicated the temple to his own god, Zeus, 
And then he tried to get his soldiers to go all over the countryside and force Jews to offer sacrifices to Zeus. Well, while this was happening at one particular location, a Jew did come forward to make the required, the demanded sacrifice. And when he did, a priest from a family that became known as the Maccabees, a priest drew his sword and killed his fellow Jews who was about to offer this sacrifice. And then they attacked the Syrian soldiers. This small event led into a big uprising among the Jews in which they were actually able eventually to gain some independence, relative independence for about a century from around the 160s BC to 63 BC when the Romans came in and took control. So for about 100 years, they had relative independence. Now, what does this have to do with Hanukkah? Well, when Jerusalem and the temple were recaptured by the Maccabean family, they rededicated the temple. They cleansed it, they purged it, and they, they relit the menorah. And this time period, these eight days of rededication became known then as Hanukkah, which is from the Hebrew word chanak, which means to dedicate. It's also the verb used in Proverbs in that famous verse about train up a child in the way he should go. So chanak, which could be translated dedicate this child. But either way, Hanukkah is from chanak, which means to dedicate. The Greek equivalent of that then, which we have in John 10, is in kynia, so dedicate. So that is a quick run-through as to the, the origin of Hanukkah. Now, why is it important for understanding this particular story? Because Hanukkah began as a dispute among Jews. And now we have a dispute among Jews once more. We have Jesus, the Jewish rabbi, and he's going to be in a dispute with these people who encircle him and demand to know whether he is the Messiah or not. Hanukkah began as a dispute among the Jews. Now, at Hanukkah, it is also now a dispute once more. And another thing to keep in mind, almost every Jewish festival brought with it a, a sort of a, 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 an earnest desire for a rekindling of the, the former independence that the Jews had before they were under, uh, under the control of, well, the, the Babylonians or the Persians or the Greeks, or the Syrians, the Romans, all of these, all of these powers that had them in submission all those years. So anytime that Passover rolled around or Hanukkah rolled around and there were a bunch of Jews in Jerusalem, it was kind of a, it was an atmosphere that was tense because you did have this, this desire that was made even stronger by everyone coming together, a desire for independence once more. And then this takes place, we're told, during winter, which in John's gospel, you know, he often has contrast of light and darkness. He uses the times of day and the seasons of the year in order to teach spiritual truths. So this is winter, it's cold, it's dark. And so there's also this idea, even in winter, of the desire for spring to arrive. Hanukkah would have been celebrated, by the way, in the month of Kislev, the 25th, which is November or December. Thus, of course, it's wintertime. So that's, that is why, that's why this is all important. This is when this is taking place. So that's the setting. Now, let's hear about what happens when Jesus and his fellow Jews begin talking to each other. We read in John 10, 24, So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are ho Christos, if you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Now, I put the Greek there because it's just, as a, as a reminder to us, we get so used to saying Jesus Christ that we often forget that Christ is a title. It comes from the Hebrew word Mashiach, which means anointed. So it's the Messiah, and here it's in Greek, the Christ. So if you are the Messiah, if you are the anointed one of God, then tell us plainly. Also interesting, the verb that's used here for how they gathered around him could also be translated, they encircled him. This is certainly, uh, this is a hostile encircling that's taking place here. And the verb reflects that. The verb is kuklao, and it's used multiple times in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, to describe what enemies do. In fact, in Psalm 22, it is the verb used in the Septuagint for how the dogs have surrounded or encircled the crucified Messiah. Psalm 118 uses it several times to describe how the nations, the Gentiles, surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I will cut them off. They kuklao, they surrounded me. They surrounded me on every side. So it's used repeatedly to describe how the enemies encircle 
the psalmist in Psalm 118. And so here they encircle Christ. They're not just going to gather around to have a chat with him. They're gathering around with hostile intent. So they say to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? That's at least the way the ESV translates this. The Greek idiom is a little bit strange. So literally it would be something like, how long will you take away our life? And the NET Bible notes say it can mean kind of to, to keep in, in, in suspense. It's the idea of, you know, we're waiting for a conclusion to something. I don't know modern Greek, but evidently in modern Greek, the phrase means to annoy, to to bother. And that certainly kind of is the sense here. How long are you going to annoy us by not telling us whether you are the Christ? Now, if you know uh, enough about Jesus' interaction with the Jewish leadership of his day, they're not eager to find out if he's a Christ so they can believe in him, so they can follow him. They want to use his admission against him. So this is by no means coming from good motives when they say, tell us, are you the Christ or not? So that's a question. That's the demand, we might say. How does Jesus respond? Well, this is John 10, 25 through 30, and this is the rest of the reading from Sunday. We'll just go ahead and read it all together, and then we'll, we'll uh, look at several details in the next few minutes. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. The Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Before we leave this page, notice he says, no one will snatch them out of my hand, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Really cool how Jesus puts these two together. The hand of Christ and the hand of the Father, they too are of one purpose and one goal. So bit by bit, let's work through this. First of all, Jesus says, I, my works bear witness of me. So I told you by means of my works, they bear witness of who I am. It's very similar, by the way, to Matthew chapter 11. You may recall this famous scene when John's in prison and he sends word by two of his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? And remember how Jesus answered them. He doesn't simply say, yes, I'm the Messiah. Yes, I am the coming one, so go tell John that. No, he says, go and tell John what you see, what you hear, and see. So go tell John what you witness. And what do you witness? Well, the blind are seeing again, the lame are walking, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel, the good news preached to them. So Jesus told John by means of these messengers kind of the same thing. My works bear witness of me. It's a reminder that when Jesus came, he didn't just simply come and say, I am the Christ, I am the Messiah. No, by his actions, by what he did, he wanted his people to see that he was fulfilling what the Old Testament prophets had said, what, who the Messiah would be and what he would do. So when he tells John, so look at what I'm doing, he's basically quoting from Isaiah 35. And he's saying, read Isaiah 35, John, look at what I'm doing. If they line up, there's your answer. I am the Messiah. Same thing he's telling his fellow Jews here. My works bear witness of me. What I am doing is exactly in correspondence with, it's a mirror image of what the prophets said the Messiah would do. So there's your answer. I don't need to tell you my works bear witness of me. Kind of interesting too. If you want to look at more detail, it's Psalm 77. I know it's very small on the screen here, but maybe you can make out some of this. If not, just look it up in your own Bibles. Psalm 77, the first part, but the first nine or ten verses are talking about the, the pain and the suffering that the people of God are enduring. So where are you, God? Have you forgotten us? Have your promises come to an end? And then notice how the psalmist transitions in verse 11, where the, the red arrow is. So after lamenting and saying, what shall I do? He says, I know what I'll do. I will remember the deeds of the Lord, your wonders from of old. I'll ponder your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. In other words, I will look at what you have done because they bear witness of what kind of God you are. 
And then in, in verse 16, where the green arrow is, he thinks back especially to the Exodus. When the waters saw God and the deeps trembled, and of course there was a, the, the dry land appearing so that Israel passed through. And then a very cool tie in here in verse 20, where the yellow area is. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. So the psalm talks about the deeds of, of, of the Lord, remembering those. It refers back to the Red Sea. And then we also have the shepherd imagery, which is going to come up in John's gospel as well in, in chapter 10. So Jesus says, my sheep, hear my voice. It's, it, it's, it's hard to accent too strongly just how much hearing, having ears to hear, permeates the scriptures. Here in Greek, it's akuo, to hear. We get our English word acoustics from akuo. The Greek behind that is shema, which is a pretty well-known Hebrew verb. That's the shema Yisrael, hear, O Israel. Over and over, God is saying to his people, open your ears. Listen to what I have to say to you. So your ears are the organ through which my word comes to you, and my word is that which produces faith in you. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ, as Paul says. So listen to what I have to say. My sheep listen to me. They have ears that hear my voice. And the reason his Jewish opposition were not hearing is because they had closed their ears to the words of God, and they'd even closed their eyes to the deeds that Jesus was doing. Now, when he says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, he, of course, is building upon all of this Old Testament shepherd imagery. But it wasn't just isolated to the Old Testament and the life of Israel. Permeating the ancient Near East was the idea that the leaders of nations were shepherds. That was a very common title for leaders or princes or kings in various parts of the ancient world. So if you look at the Mesopotamian man of a legend, Gilgamesh, who ruled the city of Uruk, he's called a shepherd. The Babylonian king, Humurabi, you're probably familiar with the law code named after him, he's called a shepherd. In Assyria and Egypt, their rulers were called shepherds. There on your screen, I have a picture of King Tut. And one of, that's, that's a shepherd's crook there on the lid of his coffin because the Egyptian rulers were also thought of as shepherds. And so they have that iconic shepherd's crook on the, the coffin of, of the Pharaoh. And then even if you get into, for instance, the, the Iliad and the Odyssey, Agamemnon, other Greek leaders were called shepherds. Plato's Republic talks about the uh, justice needs to be under the metaphor of a shepherd or a ruler for the sheep who are the ruled. So shepherd and sheep imagery are very common in the ancient Near, ancient Near East, but they're also very common in the Bible itself. So let's look at some examples of that. All the way in Genesis chapter 48, Jacob, when he's blessing his grandsons, invokes the God who's been my shepherd all my life long to this day. And then in Numbers 27, Moses, when, he's, when God's talking to him about his death, he's afraid that Israel will be left as sheep that have no shepherd. And so God promises that, promises him that Joshua will, will take his place to shepherd the people of Israel. Psalm 77 verse 20 says that God, like a shepherd, led Israel through the wilderness. How? By the hand of Moses and Aaron. And then, of course, the Lord says to David, you will be my shepherd, the shepherd of my people Israel. God took him from shepherding sheep to shepherd his people Israel. So kings, rulers, leaders in Israel are thought of as shepherds. I think it's a, it's a little bit different way of envisioning what it means for Jesus to be our good shepherd. For him to be our good shepherd in Old Testament parlance is for him to be our good king, our good ruler. He takes care of us. He leads us. He guides us. He is the, the regal Messiah who cares for us. And then, if you have time, take a look at the entirety of Ezekiel chapter 34, which is often the Old Testament reading for Good Shepherd Sunday, because Ezekiel 34 contrasts the good and the bad shepherds of Israel. And over and over in Ezekiel 34, beginning with verse 11, there's a first person singular, I. God says, I will search for my sheep and seek them out. I will rescue them. I will gather them. I will be the shepherd of my sheep. So Yahweh is promising that he's going to be the one who shepherds his people. But then later in the chapter, 
he says this, I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them and he shall be their shepherd. David, often in the Old Testament prophets, is the name given to the Messiah. So God says, on the one hand, I'm going to be the shepherd of my people. And he says, on the other hand, I'm going to send David to be the shepherd of my people. Why? Because the David Messiah, Jesus, he is Yahweh in the flesh. So Yahweh shepherds his people, and he does so because he comes down as the Davidic Messiah to shepherd his sheep so that they hear his voice, and he rules and cares, rules over and cares for them. And because he does this, what can no one do? No one can snatch them out of the Father's hand. No one can snatch them out of his hand because he's the shepherd who protects them. That Greek verb for snatch is harpazo. If you've ever read about the, the, the mythological harpies, who are kind of female-looking birds that snatch and tear at people, that's where they get their name, from harpazo, so they're harpies. It can be translated lots of different ways, caught, take, plunder, carry away, snatch, and then I put some Old Testament references there where it's used in the Septuagint, where wool, the Israel's prince, their evil princes are like wolves, harpazo, tearing prey. And then in Psalm 22, again, the Messiah says that his enemies open wide their mouth at him as a harpazo, as a, as a ravening or tearing lion. When Jacob sees Joseph's coat of many colors, that's been you know, the, these brothers have put blood on it. He assumes some wild beast has harpazo, Joseph, has torn him to pieces. So when you hear that particular word about snatching or tearing harpazo, think in terms of, of wolves or lions who are threatening to take Christ's sheep. That, 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 that the devil, like a lion, prowling, roaring, wanting to snatch away one of Christ's own. And Christ says, no, that's not going to happen because I am the shepherd who protects my sheep. Now, this, this verse often comes up in discussions of uh, eternal security, once saved, always saved. If you're interested, I've dealt with that question in a 1517 article entitled, Once Saved, Always Saved. That's a good question. So if you go to 1517.org, search for my name, and once saved, always saved, you can check out what I have, what I have to say there. Let's try and pull all of this together into one or two sentences. At the Hanukkah feast, celebrating the overthrow of Israel's enemies and the rededication of the temple, and the temple originally was built by the son of David, by Solomon. At that Hanukkah feast, Jesus identifies himself in the temple as the divine son of David, who will rescue his people and shepherd them as both God and king, for he is one with the Father. Jesus is the Hanukkah good shepherd. And that's how all of this kind of comes together. The context is important here because Hanukkah celebrated the overthrow of Israel's enemies and the rededication of the temple. And then every time it was celebrated, there was this, this earnest desire for God once more to give his people freedom and rescue and liberation in the Messiah. And so his, the Jewish leadership surrounds Jesus and says, are you the guy? Are you the Messiah? And Jesus says, my deeds testify that I am, but we also know from the broader context of the Gospels that he's not going to rescue them in the same way that the Maccabean rulers rescued his people. Instead, by giving his own life, by the shepherd laying down his life for the sheep, he is going to rescue his people and provide that liberation that they have been wanting. Liberation for the entire world. So at Hanukkah, at this festival, celebrating the overthrow of the enemies of Israel, and the rededication of the temple, he who is the son of David in the flesh, the shepherd that Ezekiel 34 talked about, who is Yahweh himself, he comes, and he's the one who provides us with freedom and liberation in his life, death, and resurrection on our behalf. Hope that you're all doing well, and I hope this brief survey of how the Old Testament shines light on John 10 has been helpful to you. If it has been, please share it with your friends. May God's mercy and peace in Jesus, the Messiah, be yours in abundance. We'll see you next week.